Hello, welcome to this lecture on migration theory. In this first lecture I'm going to give you an overview about uh, why we need theory, um, what different uh, reasons we have to look differently at migration and why we actually need theory for that. So it will somehow outline the structure of the other lectures as well, the other four lectures in this series on uh, migration theory. Um, there are a number of obstacles uh, for understanding migration uh, and there are a number of reasons why still the understanding of migration is relatively limited. Um, first of all, there's a huge fragmentation across different social science disciplines. For instance, there's economists, there's sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists, legal scholars, all studying, and geographers of course, all studying migration. And they often very much do so in a self-contained way. They often don't communicate that well with another. Now there's another sort of divide running right across those disciplinary divides. That's the divide between different methods of research, particularly quantitative and qualitative methods. A second problem is that migration studies tend to be focused very much on the receiving countries. So the focus on integration, immigration, uh, policies often have a sort of focus on the interests and impacts of migration on wealthy countries in Northern Europe um, or in North America and more recently other new countries like uh, Japan, South Korea have also become immigration countries and their focus is very much on what does migration mean for us. Now this coincides with a lack of understanding and interest in uh, the causes and consequences of migration for origin countries of migrants. And this is another explanation why our understanding and theories of migration are rather incomplete. A third problem is that migration studies as a field is very much dom st uh, dominated by the perspective of the state and the interests of policymakers. And this coincides with this receiving country bias. It's often very much focused on short-term problems. Uh, policymakers often respond to public outrage or concern about certain issues, which again sort of reinforces this focus on very particular issues. For instance, in the case of Europe, on integration, uh, cultural identity, and so on and so forth, which explain why we have a limited understanding of what actually drives migration processes. And as I've said, uh, this coincides with a short-term focus. And this is a problem because the only real way to understand migration is to adopt a long-term perspective, to see how has migration evolved over time. And this will all, only, only this will allow us to understand what has changed. Now, this limited understanding of migration is quite evident in migration policies, which often fail to meet their stated objectives. And it reveals a very weak theoretical basis of migration studies and our sort of limited ability to understand what drives migration processes, how are causes of migration, the consequences of migration, origin and destination countries interlinked. And paradoxically, if we want to be more relevant for policies as well in the sense of better understanding migration, it is important to take a certain distance from the immediate concerns of policymakers and try to move towards a more fundamental understanding of migration. Now what I'll try to do in this lecture is try to highlight why we really need to reconceptualize the common ways we think to, tend to think about migration and why we need to challenge a number of assumptions that drive a lot of migration policy making. First example is the normal categories that we use to understand migration. They're mostly focused on particular categories that policymakers tend to use and they're quite uncritically adopted by migration research. The problem is that these categories are of course useful for, for, administration, um, for administration and policymakers but they do not necessarily contribute to a better understanding of migration and in some cases they actually can hinder a better understanding of migration. And not all these categories are necessarily meaningful in a more social scientific sense. For instance, if we look at the category of temporary permanent migration, we tend to say, for instance, or policymakers might say that after two or three years of, of, 
of settlement, a migrant is permanent. And before that, a migrant is temporary. But of course, these boundaries are very ambiguous. Many permanent migrants or migrants who think they're permanent end up being temporary migrants because they return and the other way around. There's many temporary migrants who end up settling permanently. What about international and internal migration? It does seem to make a lot of sense. It's involved with border cro crossing. But on the other hand, movement within a big country like China can often involve much, the crossing of much bigger distances in terms of geography and cultural differences, economic differences rural to urban context, and for instance, migration between the Netherlands and the UK. Or another big country, for instance, in India or in Nigeria or in Brazil. So what is the essence of the difference between internal and international migration? We really need to question those assumptions that these are fundamentally different forms of migration. In fact, it is well possible to understand both forms of migration in one single perspective. Take another example home and host countries. It does reveal a lot of values in a way, those terms. They are not unproblematic because the notion of home somehow seems to be linked with the notion that migrants ought to go back at some point. And the notion of host countries really goes along with this idea that countries are somehow hosting migrants and there might be a potential burden. Whereas on the other hand, we know that a lot of migration is demand-driven. So migrants fulfill a very important role. And it also includes the notion somehow that migrants should be grateful to be received. And it might actually justify not giving migrants rights. So in this sense, it seemed to be better to speak about origin or destination countries. These seem to be more neutral terms. What about legal and illegal migration? Those sound perfectly normal categories to many people. The point is not so much to make the distinction between legal and illegal forms of migration, but it is important to notice that in many societies, what we call illegal migration is a socially illicit form of behavior. So what lawmakers would disapprove of, people involved in migration would see as desirable. In many countries, illegal migration is the way to get access to better livelihood and to better incomes. So it's sanctioned by local communities and families. And another example is, for instance, the difference between forced and voluntary migration. Can we really put up this dichotomy? Because do not all people who move face some constraints in moving? And do not even most refugees have some level of choice, at least in terms of where they're going? So kind of this shows that it is problematic that we need to question those categories that we tend to use quite unproblematically. Now this leads us to a series of key questions which are understand, important if we want to understand migration processes. For instance, how to deal with complexity. It's often said that it is impossible to theorize about migration because migration is such a complex process. But on the other hand, as we will see in this lecture series, migration is also a very patent process. There are clear regularities. If we look at where migrants move to and come from. So yes, every single migration move is unique, but there are some general characteristics. Another challenge is how to integrate economic and non-economic explanations of migration. Economics is a social science, and it would be artificial to think that there's a fundamental differences between economic and non-economic explanations. And in this lecture series, We'll also explore both economic and non-economic theories and try to show how they hang together. Another problem is the issue of causality. So is it migration impacting development or growth or other forms of broader change, or is it rather the other way around? The issue I'll try to stress in this lecture series, it's both. And instead of just seeing migration as a cause or an effect, we should learn to see migration as an intrinsic part of broader change processes. This is linked to the next issue, which is how to deal with structure and agency. Certain theories very much focus on how the overall structure and big macro processes determine the way people move and make choices, whereas other theories very much focus on people's individual decision making. 
the real change challenge is to integrate those theories because only by integrating and by acknowledging the role of structure and agency simultaneously we can better understand migration processes because both structure and agency are relevant now in order to sort of highlight the need to reconceptualize migration and the, the need to sort of revisit uh, our certainties about migration, I will run you through a, cha a number of assumptions that are quite common in discussions, policy making, and also research about migration, which if we have a closer look, are very problematic. And I hope that these examples will convince you that yes, there is a need for more theory, there is a need for more fundamental understanding of what drives migration and how migration affects change. And this is the list of assumptions. The first of all is that we live in an age of unprecedented mass migration. It is very common to think this. The second is that poverty is the main cause of South-North migration. And the third is that Development is the only real way to reduce migration, particularly from poor countries. Another assumption is that over the last decades, migration policies have become much more restrictive. We now talk about the fortress Europe, and we see border fences being erected uh, between the Mexican and U.S. borders. The fifth idea is that migration restrictions will reduce migration. And the sixth issue is that climate change will lead to mass migration. I'm going to zoom in on a few of those assumptions and try to show some evidence which will in some ways turn upside down some of these assumptions and will show that migration looks quite differently and that also the processes that drive migration are quite different from what we often think. Let me start with the first one. That's the idea that we live in an age of unprecedented mass migration. And the general narrative is that globalization, which is the integration of regional economies, societies, the increasing interconnectedness between cultures through communication and trade, and also the transport and communication technologies which have vastly expanded and have decreased in costs over the last few decades. Just think about modern air transport and the internet and mobile phone technology have all facilitated mobility and have made it easier for people to travel and move around the globe. And with this also we see a sort of generic income increase. I mean most societies in the world have become at least slightly wealthier than let's say 40 to 50 years ago and many societies have become much wealthier which means that more people can afford to travel. And a fourth issue is that it's often said we see increase in global income inequalities which have motivated more and more people to migrate, particularly from poor to rich countries. Now, if we just look at World Bank data on the global migration migrant stock, which is a sort of global, an estimate of a global number of people in the world who live in another country than they've been born in. And it seems to confirm this hypothesis. In 1960, there were about 90 million people living abroad in the world. And in 2000, this figure was already 170 million people. And right now, it is well above 180 million or perhaps higher. So it totally seems to confirm this image that we do live in an age of migration, which is unprecedented. However, world population has grown almost at an equal pace over that period. So if we calculate the total number of global migrants as a percentage of the world population against using World Bank data, we actually see that there has been a slight decrease. And it's often been said that one century ago, with the great migrations from Europe to North America, the percentage was probably even higher. So this somehow questions the whole assumption whether we have seen a massive increase in international mobility. And it also questions this idea that it will just increase in the future. We just don't know. So, why is this? Why do we think we live in an age of mass migration? Are the numbers wrong? Very unlikely, because if we, I mean, the numbers might not be exactly right, but whether we use UN population division data or World Bank data, we generally seem to see, 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 seem to see the same patterns. 
Or is there something else going on? Has the nature of migration changed? Or our perception, so the way we look at migration, has it changed? The answer is the latter. But the question is, how and why has the nature and our way of looking at migration changed? But first of all, getting back to the sort of theory, how can we explain that development and globalization has not really coincided with more migration? Now let's first of all consider the role of technology. It's a very ambiguous role if we think about it because, yes, technology does allow people to communicate more easily and efficiently and to travel against lower costs. But on the other hand, technology has also facilitated trade, outsourcing, commuting, teleworking and telemeeting, which means that it has also potentially taken away a certain need for migration. For instance, the big industries that have been shifted from Northwestern Europe and North America to low-wage countries like China, of course, um, have potentially taken away a certain labor demand in those countries. And just think about call centers, for instance, uh, which have been massively relocated from the United States, United Kingdom, for instance, to India, or working in export processing zones, for instance, in the maquiladores in Mexico. So, and if we really put on a long-term view, we could even say that technological advances, starting with the invention of agriculture, have historically enabled settlement of people. So we really need to question those assumptions. Again, this is another reason to think more fundamentally about migration. Now, what has changed is not so much over the last 50 years, not so much the sort of total relative volume of migration, but it is particularly the sort of directions of migration. And look at the yellow graph. It's particularly Europe that has fundamentally changed its role in the global migration picture. Roughly until the Second World War, it were Europeans who moved out of Europe to settle, to conquest, to occupy foreign lands, and become sort of to create new settler societies. Now what we've seen since the Second World War is a big migration reversal, that European countries have progressively, progressively turned from emigration countries to immigration countries. And more overall, we have seen a particular increase in so-called South-North migration. So that's been the big change. And of course, that might have also some explanatory value why in the West, and particularly Europe, we think that migration is at an all-time high, because Europe has indeed seen unprecedented inflows of migrants from outside Europe over the last few decades. But on a global scale, we cannot say such a thing. Just think about the Americas, which are, of course, the products of mass immigration. So yes, we see a certain extent we see a reversal of global migration flows. Perhaps there are other things to say about what impact has globalization had on migration. Technology, particularly transport and communication technology, has perhaps increased the scope for migrants to live transnationally, to keep in touch constantly with countries of origin, to travel back and forth a lot. And perhaps this has increased the scope to develop transnational dual identities and allegations. The third issue is that it's perhaps more the non-migratory mobility that has been increasing as an effect of globalization and technological process. Just think about commuting, tourism, and business visits. They have, of course, gone up massively, not so much migration. And actually, those forms of non-migratory mobility might have taken away uh, the need for potential migration. A fourth issue is that nation states have increasingly emphasized the need to control migration. This is often a reaction to popular concerns about immigration and have really put migration on top of domestic policy agenda. So we are more concerned about migration, whether that's for good or wrong reasons, it's a fact that migration has risen to the top of political agendas in European countries. So when we are more interested in migration, we tend to see, see it more and we then tend to problematize it more. Now, putting on a sending country perspective, we can say that we live in an age of involuntary immobility because it has been argued by researchers like Jürgen Carling that with the increase of immigration controls and the increase of 
people in the world that would like to migrate but who are not able to migrate because of those controls, there is an increase in frustration and we see an increase in people who are involuntarily immobile in many developing countries. So from the last two bullet points, we might say that both from a receiving and a sending country perspective, we now live in migration obsessed societies. So it's been partly a real change and partly perceptual change. So do we live in an age of unprecedented mass migration? Yes, but primarily in the minds of immigration obsessed Europeans. Perhaps we might talk about the colonial backlash in which Europeans have been confronted with migration from countries that they colonized in the past. And it's probably more appropriate to say that we live in an age of mobility than in an age of migration. What about the second issue? The idea that development will reduce migration. Now, perhaps you know these images of boat migrants who try to cross from Northern Africa or Western Africa to the Southern European shores or the Canary Islands. There have been several instances of, of this boat migration over the last decade. Now, this has often led to big concerns about this migration and this idea that this will only increase in the future. Now, it's important to say that the relative numbers of those migrant, boat migrants are actually very low compared to other migration. It only represents 1 to 2 percent of total immigration in Europe, for instance. And that the assumption that it would be a mass phenomenon needs to be questioned. But that's a side issue. The real issue is, will development reduce migration? It's often said, and there are often summits being organized uh, between African and European countries where it's been said by policymakers that we need to stimulate development because it will lead to less migration. There's only one problem, is that we know that the countries in the world with the highest migration rates, so the, the highest numbers of people living abroad, particularly in European countries and Northern America, are typically not the poorest countries because it takes resources to migrate, to start with one thing. And there's a whole theory we're going to come back to uh, in another lecture, uh, which argues that development initially leads to a big increase in out migration rather than a decrease. And this is what we actually see. If we think about the major immigration countries in the world, like Philippines or Turkey or Morocco or Mexico, they're typically not among the poorest countries in the world. So this kind of fundamentally upsets very common assumptions in debates about migration, both in policy and research. Now, development for reduced migration is a very dangerous assumption. What we know is that the link between development is complex and nonlinear, and that paradoxically, takeoff development may trigger off, trigger takeoff emigration. And we'll come back to this issue in a few lectures. Third assumption is that migration policies have become much more restrictive over the last decades. And images of border fences separating Spanish enclaves on the Moroccan coast, heavy border patrolling along those fences, and similar situations along the US-Mexican border have sort of fed into that assumption. Now, if we have a closer look at immigration policies, we need to question that assumption as well. Yes, we see that there have been increasing restrictions, but only for certain groups. For, for example, asylum seekers or to a certain extent, low-skilled workers. For the skilled, we have seen the reverse process. Most immigration countries have opened their gates and have actually actively attracted high-skilled migrants, whereas also temporary migrant, lower-skilled migrants have been welcomed. And we see that a lot of this idea that migration policies have become more restrictive are explained by the rhetorics, which are very much focused on reducing numbers, but if we look at actual migration measures, we get a much more subtle picture. And I emphasize the need to correct for the receiving country bias, and this is another example, because we only think about immigration restrictions. If we look at origin countries, we see a reverse process, where, let's say, 20 to 30 years ago, a lot of countries in the world tried to prevent people from migrating away. That almost all origin countries, with a few exceptions like North Korea and Cuba, have abolished exit controls. So it's become easier for people to leave their countries. So that has potentially also counterbalanced 
the increasing restrictions for certain numbers of migrants. Another example, which is the assumption that migration restrictions reduce migration. Just look at this graph. It is one graph among many others of many immigration countries which shows the neat connection between processes of economic growth, more precisely the business cycle, and the migration rate. And for most immigration countries, we find a very neat association between economic growth and immigration, which of course leads us to question what difference do migration policies really make if we look at this graph. Policymakers like to make the impression they're in control, but what actually drives the process? The economy seems to grow, uh, play a very important role, and the influence of business cycles and labor demand seems to be far bigger than the actually migration regulatory framework. And we also know, and we'll come back to that in a few lectures' time, that migration and migrant networks facilitate migration. And that supply and demand factors, such as the demand for labor in the business cycle, play a very big role in determining the level and also selection of migrations. And it seems quite naive to think that policies can reverse those structural causes of migration. At least migration policies can't. So you'd have to look at other policies, like labor markets and economic and trade policies, um, to do something to, to affect somehow the root causes of migration. And we also see that immigration restrictions, as long as the causes of migration remain in place, like labor demand, have a number of perverse or unintended or what I call substitution effects. For instance, if you close down immigration for one category, for instance labor markets, we often see that migrants start jumping categories. So they might then start migrating as family migrants or asylum seekers. We also see spatial substitution. It's the sort of waterbed effect, the idea that if one country increases restrictions, migrants tend to go to surrounding countries, which they might even use as a transit country to eventually migrate to their eventual destination. We also see intertemporal uh, substitution effects. This is the so-called now or never migration, or beat the band rush, which migrants tend to use when a new restrictive measure is on the horizon. For instance, when Suriname became independent from the Netherlands, Surinamese massively migrated to the Netherlands until the migration ban was introduced. And we also know a phenomenon like reverse flow substitution. What it means that even if immigration restrictions reduce the inflows, they also tend to reduce reverse flows, which means that the effect on net migration is quite ambiguous. So migration restrictions primarily change the ways in which people migrate. And their effects on volumes of migration are much more ambiguous and much smaller than is often assumed. So we have seen this number of assumptions that we live in an age of unprecedented migration, development to reduce migration, migration policies have become more restrictive, and that restrictions lead to less migration. But what we see in reality is that Current global migration is not exceptionally high. Takeoff development may quite well lead to takeoff emigration. Migration policies privilege particular groups and emigration policies have been liberalized. And migration restrictions tend to have limited and unintended effects. I hope that these examples have shown you that we really need to rethink the way we conceptualize migration, and we study migration, and we understand migration. And that we have to go from just describing trends and to think that any association means a causal relationship going to a real fundamental understanding of migration, about both the nature of migration and the causes of migration processes. So we need to understand why do people migrate? How can we understand that migration happens in quite clear-cut patterns, that people just don't move randomly across the world, but we see very clear and clustered migration flows? And that migration is much more a predictable phenomenon than is quite often assumed. It's also important to distinguish individual motivations from the more macro-level causes, and this brings me back to the issue of agency and structure. 
And the last issue is that we have to understand the so-called internal feedback dynamics of migration processes, which often explain why migration gains its own momentum. And the creation of migration networks is a very good example of that. The key issue is to get an understanding, to, to reconceptualize our understanding of migration as an intrinsic part of broader development processes, rather than a problem to be solved, which is sort of usual take, particularly from policy. And this also necessitates us to think more about general social theories and to try to embed our understanding of migration in more general social scientific theories. And in the end, this more fundamental understanding of migration will also allow for a more realistic understanding of the effect of policies. And the challenge is, it's really how to deal with complexity and diversity of migration processes. So on the one hand, every single instance of migration is unique, but they are part of broader processes about which we can generalize. And this necessitates us to understand people's individual migration decisions within the broader processes of development and change. And this brings me back to a crucial issue where I'll conclude this lecture with, which is we need to simultaneously understand the role of agency and structure in migration processes. Just a quick definition, because these terms will come back in the next lectures. Agency is basically the capacity for individual human beings to make their own choices and to impose those choices, impose those choices on the world. So includes a notion of power of people to change the things as they are, to alter structure, which is the pattern of relations, factors such as social class, religion, gender, ethnicity, power, markets or networks, which somehow constrain the opportunities that individuals have. So nobody is entirely free and the range of choices we have are limited, but at the same time people do have a certain power to change those structural patterns. So any meaningful understanding of social processes, including migration, has to take into account agency and structure and how they interact. And I think the example of forced migration is a good one. Refugee migration is often seen as a no choice migration. And for sure this is the case in terms of refugees have a well-founded fear of persecution or have to fear their lives in their origin countries. So in a way they don't have much choice in that sense about whether to leave or not. But for instance, most refugees do have a certain choice in terms of where then to go to, which means that even in very constrained forms of migration, there is a level of agency. And the initial choices of refugees about where to go to might influence where future migrants will go to and can lead to migration networks. So it can lead to the creation of new structures. So these examples serve to illustrate further the key message of this lecture series is that we need to understand migration as an intrinsic part of broader structural change. To see how broader development and globalization processes lead to migration, but also how migrants agency in their turn affect our structures. So how migration might also affect development and growth in origin and sending countries. And this graph somehow depicts this relationship. We talk about reciprocity between migration and broader processes of development, globalization and social transformation. The setup of the course is as follows. The first lecture after this introduction will give a more fundamental overview of theories about the causes of migration. And I will try to cluster these theories in two broad paradigms, a functionalist and a structural paradigm. The third lecture will focus on the impacts of migration. So how does migration affect broader processes of development and change? The fourth lecture will look at theories that explain why migration once it has started, tends to gain its own momentum and becomes a partly self-perpetuating processes. So migration leads to more migration in many cases. And a series of theories, in particular network theory, migration system theory, and cumulative causation theory, will help us to understand the perpetuation of migration. The fifth and last lecture will try to wrap those 
four lectures up by showing how we can use the different theories we have discussed to achieve a more fundamental understanding of migration as an intrinsic part of development and change. And we particularly stress those theories which we could summarize as migration transition or mobility transition theory, which explain why development generally leads to higher levels of migration and mobility rather than the other way around. And this fundamentally upsets commonsensical uh, ideas about, about migration and push-pull theories, which many policymakers and researchers still tend to use, but yield a very simplistic and often very flawed understanding of what actually drives migration. So it's development driving migration, and migration has its own impacts on development. It's a fundamentally uh, two-way relationship. So migration is an intrinsic part of development and change, rather than a problem to be solved. 